can hear me. Um, I just want to give you a big welcome to the bio revision lecture for the September lecture series. Um, hopefully everybody watching this is a grade 12 about to go into externals or a grade 11 who is in a uh, accelerated subject doing bio 3 and 4. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later on in the lecture, but today is basically, it's not going to be too, too content, content heavy. Um, it's just going to be me giving you practice exam questions, um, in preparation to, uh, externals. So hopefully in terms of the timeline, um, you guys would have just come out of doing mocks for like from school. Um, Maybe you've received your marks back for mocks already, maybe you haven't and you're waiting for them to uh, come out. But uh, this holiday period is probably a very good idea to get some revision and um, some exam practice done. So if you haven't had a chance to check out any of the other lectures from this uh, series out already, please go ahead and do so. I know there's um, a bunch of revision sessions going forward for um, maths, methods, uh, chemistry, all of the main like core subjects. Um, other than that, I do hope that the motivation carries through and you guys don't uh, burn out too quickly. Uh, but without further ado, let's get started with today's lecture. So uh, before going into the actual content of today's lecture, I want to run you guys through what ATAR notes is and how it can sort of help um, with your external prep going forward. So if you haven't had a chance to um, interact with any of our resources yet, ATAR Notes is a company made by previous students uh, for current students. So all of our tutors here, um, at least at QCE, are previous graduates for the ATAR system. All of us have uh, graduated either 2020 or past that. Um, I myself am a 2021 graduate, so I was the second year to go through ATAR. And they were running these lecture series um, even back then when I was in high school. And I was listening to them in grade 11 and 12, and they were pretty helpful. Um, so all in all, if you check out our website, obviously most of you who would have registered would have had a chance to see it already. But there are a whole heap of resources on that website that are available to you uh, completely for free. So that includes things like study notes, the lecture series, um, for you to download for almost any of the main subjects. I've managed to get um, past papers from the ATAR notes website before, which is very helpful. Um, there's discussions, so forums where you can answer questions, ask questions and have them answered by our students. Um, revision articles and videos uh, for all of your subjects and an ATAR calculator as well, um, which will give you a very rough idea about what kind of subject scores you need to get the ATAR that you want. Um, there's heaps more on our website, so please feel free to check it out. I'm sure there's something that will be of use to you. Um, if not, if you are in grade 11, I do just want to say that these uh, lecture series are running every single holiday. So if you've got any other um, subjects that you need to study for, that you're going to start grade 12 work for, they, um, Head Start lectures will be running from January and the following April and June as well. If you're in grade 12, this will be the last lecture series that um, you'll be able to attend to. So I hope um, the takeaways from today will be, will be good, even though it's mainly just going to be revision. So a little bit about me, um, thought it would be good for you to know about your tutor a little bit. Um, my name is Amandi, nice to meet you all. I am a 2021 graduate from Ipswich Girls Grammar School, and I graduated high school with a 99.4 ATAR. Um, uh, currently, I am studying uh, biomedical science at UQ, and I do also have provisional entry into medicine. Um, so if you do have any questions about uni life, uni application, QTAC, any of that sort of thing, um, I'm happy to answer. Uh, just use the chat box down below. Um, during grade 12, I studied biology, chemistry, English, Japanese methods, and specialist. I like to tell people that I did uh, two languages, two masters, and two sciences. Um, and finally, keep your head up. You're in that final stretch before graduation. Externals are looming and it can be quite, um, you know, an exhausting period of time. But at the end of the day, you guys will have one of the best holidays you've, you'll ever experience. So 
A bit of an overview for how today is going to work. Today is not going to be very content heavy. Um, in fact, all I'm going to be doing uh, today is giving you exam practice questions. Um, it's a combination of short response and multiple choice. Um, and I'll also be talking you through the cognitive verbs to each of the question and how to maximize your marks. If you have any questions, there is a chat box to uh, use uh, below the video. I won't be answering the questions live on the stream. What you are watching right now will be a recorded um, version of the lecture, but it is going to be me live um, during the time of the lecture that you're watching answering the questions. So it just gives me the opportunity to, oh, it gives me the opportunity to answer questions that might not be 100% related to the lecture. So if you've got any about like bio study in general or uni applications or uni life, pop them down um, in the chat. And the recorded format also lets you pause and try to answer the questions yourself before looking at my explanation. Um, there will be dedicated um, Q&A time. So at the end of each topic, I'll ask if there are any questions. Um, and if you are looking for any extra resources for study, um, I'll show you some of those great places to go to throughout the lecture. So without further ado, the way that this is going to work is I'm going to pop up a question on the, the um, screen. I'll talk you through the question, um, how to approach it. And then if you guys can pause and try to answer the question, um, generally speaking, what I like to do is I like to say that each mark for the question is worth one mark, like one minute in real life. So if it's a two mark question, give yourself two minutes to answer to the best of your ability. And then afterwards, unpause the video and then I'll be going through the explanation. So hopefully that goes all smoothly. And at all, at any time, if you do have any questions about um, like my explanations or you're unsure about an aspect of the question, pop it in the chat box and I'll be able to reply, reply to you personally. Um, and other than that, if that is all good, let's get started. All right, so we have, which of the following correctly describes the term species? A, is it a group of organisms that can breed under any conditions to produce offspring, whether fertile or not? B, it's a group of organisms that can interbreed under natural conditions to produce fertile, viable offspring. C, it's a group of organisms that can interbreed under natural conditions to produce offspring, whether fertile or not. And D, it is a group of organisms that cannot breed. So pause the video here. And now I'll go through the explanation. So in terms of species in biology, it's quite a difficult thing to sort of define. Um, in fact, the most common definition of species isn't the only one that's like broadly accept, uh, expected. Um, under the QCAA, you guys will need to know about three definitions of species. The first one being the biological species concept. The second one being morphological species concept. And the third one being phylogenetic species concept. The biological species concept states that any two organisms that are considered one species will be able to interbreed in natural conditions and produce fertile and viable offspring. Um, but the thing is, there are some limitations to that definition because for fossilized organisms that have now become extinct, we have no information or no way of being able to say whether they can interbreed with other um species properly. Um, so there's, uh, and on top of that, there's also interspecific hybrids, which are offspring made by two different species that, you know, can live out a lifespan, um, which technically form their own species, but don't fit in with the biological species concept because they're not fertile. Uh, and so because of those limitations, we've got some other species concepts. Morphological species concept, which I think we're covering later on in the lecture as well, is basically saying that two organisms are considered a species based on their degree of similar morphology or similar physical characteristics. So if two have uh, two organisms have um, enough of the same like physical structure, they can be considered a species. Um, the limitation with that one though is that species will often evolve to grow very very similar characteristics if they live in an similar environment for a very long period of time. Um, for example, a dolphin and a shark 
both are marine predators, but come from two completely different classes of species. One of them is a fish, the other one is a mammal. So in no way, shape or form are the two of them related evolution-wise, but they look very, very similar in terms of their characteristics. They've got like dorsal fin, streamlined body, um, sharp teeth, hunting instincts, that kind of thing. Um, so we can't just use physical traits to classify species as well because evolution brings physical traits about because of the environment. So the third and final species concept that we've got is the phylogenetic uh, species concept. This one defines two organisms as a species based on purely based on genetic similarity. So we've uh, humans have been able to develop technologies that can break down molecular sequences, so like protein sequence, uh, sequences um, up down to the you know base pairs within a gene. The more differences there are within um, phylogeny or within like genetic similarity the less related two species are um so those are the sorry that's the third species concept and that one is limited by um the technology that we have so if we're not able to make accurate genetic screening technology the phylogenetic species concept can't exist and when you're in the field like say if you're doing field work in you know the amazon rainforest and some things and you're finding this new species or you're finding an or organism that could be a new species you have to have the correct equipment to you know take a sample of it and genetically like sequence it before you can apply the phylogenetic species concept so it's it's definitely limited by the technology that we have that being said, if we have a look at these uh, multiple choice options, you definitely don't need to know all three of them in that much detail. Um, it's very easy to say that a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed under natural conditions to produce fertile and viable offspring. So it is B. Alrighty. Um, now we're going to go into question two. So here is, what are the required assumptions of cladistics? So any group of organisms are related by um, descent from a common ancestor. Number uh, B, there is a bifurcating pattern of cladogenesis. C, the changes in traits occur in lineages over time. D, none of the above, or E, all of the above. So I'll give you a chance to pause now. And... Hopefully, all of you have done the question, and I'm going to go through the answer. So, cladistics is basically the study of the the study that arises from the phylogenetic species concept. So that was all about looking at genetic uh, sequences. Cladistics is literally mapping them out on um, a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree. So there are three assumptions that we can have. They're on the screen for you now. Um, number one is that any group of organisms related um, by descent from a common ancestor. So it's the whole principle that everything came from one living thing and then split off into uh, split off to develop new traits and new behaviors based on their environment and um, different factors. The second thing that uh, we assume with uh, cladistics is that all of the splits that happen from that common ancestor happen two at a time. So that's what bifurcating means. It means that from one common ancestor at any given time, it splits off into two. And then any further subspecies that would form from that would split off the two that split off originally. Um, cladogenesis, just in general, is a uh, is the process of creating new clades or new groups and families of species. Um, the third pattern uh, or the third assumption is that any changes that happen as species start to diverge increase over time. So the further away a current species is from the common ancestor, the more different they're going to look compared to the common ancestor um, in general. So A, B and C are actually all correct answers. So it's definitely not D, none of the above. It is E, all of the above. Uh, technically speaking, if you really wanted to you know, contest the question, DNA should be swapped. But A, B, and C are all correct. So our answer is E. Alrighty, question three. To estimate the relative abundance of deer in Australia and New Zealand, a monitoring technique called Fecal Pellet Index, FPI, has been used. It involves counting deer pellets or fecal droppings in small circles along a transect line. Which of the following is the least important factor in setting up the monitoring program and the accuracy of the data? 
So this is your time to pause. Give yourself a minute to answer the question and I'll go through the answer now. Um, all right. So important thing to note here is the kind of sampling technique that we're using. Um, this is going all the way back to unit three, like classification processes, but line transects in particular are a type of sampling used to assess distribution of an ecosystem and can be a type of stratified sampling. Um, in order to minimize bias for a line transect, you need to make sure that your line is incorporating all of the zones um, that are included in the area being studied, and you're choosing an appropriate sample size with correct equipment. So positioning, um, placing transect lines at random, that is pretty important to minimize bias. If you are, um, well, if you, sorry, Oops. Um, if you are trying to conduct a study and you're letting human influence um, or your own desires influence where you're placing the line transects, it's not going to be a fair test. So it's not the data that you're correcting is not collecting isn't going to be accurate. Um, positioning the small circles continuously next to each other along the transect. Now, this one's kind of a hard one to get your head around, but line transects are purely just a line going through a particular area being studied. And you're not, like the purpose of a line transect isn't to gather an accurate number of, or gather insight into the number of um, organisms in the area. It's not a... Um, abundance study, it's a distribution study. So line transects, it doesn't really matter where you're counting everything too, too much, as long as you're only counting the organisms that are touching the line in the transect. And then C and D, using a large number of transects of similar length and laying the transect lines in a variety of areas are all equally important. Oh, sorry about that. So the least important factor is positioning the small circles continuously next to each other along the transect, because ideally, as long as you're taking enough samples along that one line, you're still going to get information into the distribution of the ecosystem, providing that A, C, and D have already happened. So like if you've placed the line, line transects randomly, they're in a variety of areas to cover all of the zones in these um area being studied and you're using the same length of translex, it doesn't really matter too much about the circles because you're just assessing what's on the line. All right, question four. In the past, strawberry plants were produced commercially by allowing the stolen or runners to root and then transplanting the other daughter plants. Today, new plants for commercially use, commercial use are grown primarily from the cuttings of specific plants, parts of strawberry plants producing clones. The advantage of these methods of producing strawberry plants is to A, allow gardeners and farmers to produce a variety of different types of strawberries varying in size, flavor, and taste. B, avoid the need for pollination by bees and other insects. C, maintain plant variability so the strawberry species have a greater chance of survival. Or D, allow agriculturists to perform to choose plants that are known to do well in specific growing conditions and produce a high yield. So pause now, get the question done, and I'll go through the answer. All right, strawberry plants here. Something really, really important to note is that if you are using cuttings to produce offspring for something, that is asexual reproduction. Um, what that means then is that the offspring produced or like the clones of the plants produced are genetically identical to the parent plant. Why might that be an advantage is basically what this question is asking. And the reason that this is good is if you find a strawberry plant that is particularly healthy, it's got a good taste, great um, tolerance against pests, um, and gives the like high yield come harvesting time, we can reproduce that you know, beneficial uh, strawberry by creating identical crops. Um, so having that use of asexual reproduction in, um, involves the farmers getting a high yield of high quality crops, which is most like answer option D. It allows agriculturists to choose plants that are known to do well in specific growing conditions. 
copy them identically through asexual reproduction and produce a high yield. Okay. Now I've got strawberry, uh, sorry, question number five, dealing with that same level of strawberry plants. In the past, strawberry plants were produced commercially by allowing the stolons or runners to root then transplanting the dotted plants. So it's the same exact question opening. This time, um, why would there be considerable concern by environmentalists regarding the outcomes of these methods? Is it A, genetic diversity is adversely increased, resulting in competition between the plants? Is it B, natural selection of plants could be affected, leading to strawberry plants that are more susceptible to environmental factors? Is it C, food production may increase and provide more strawberries to developing countries? Or is it D, cloned strawberry plants will have be more resistant to disease and less likely to be wiped out? Okay, pause the video, get the question done. And here's the answer. Strawberry plants, once again, are asexually reproducing. And what that means is offspring is genetically identical to the parent plant. This can be really, really good if the parent plant is super convenient for the farmers. And that was what the previous question is about. But in terms of environmentalists, they're the ones who are kind of on the strawberry plant side instead of the yield side. So clones or copies of a parent crop that are genetically identical significantly reduce the biodiversity of that particular population. And that means decreased tolerance against environmental factors. So is genetic diversity adversely increased? No. So A is not our correct answer. B, natural selection of plants could be affected. This is true. Leading to the strawberry plants being more susceptible to environmental factors. This is our correct answer. As for C and D, food production may increase and provide more strawberries to developing countries. That's not something that can be uh, raising a concern. That's quite a good thing. And then D, cloned strawberry plants will be more resistant to disease and less likely to be wiped out. Well, that's just untrue because clones, if all of the strawberry plants are identical to each other, none of them are going to... Uh, Sorry, if all of them are identical to each other and there's an environmental change that happens that wipes out one of them, all of them are going to be wiped out. So this is not a correct statement at all. Okay, we're going into question six now. In the Avon wheat belt of Western Australia, the acorn banksia or banksia prionotis flowers late in the spring and is the only source of nectar for the honey eaters, which feed on and pollinate its flowers. Honey eaters are important pollinators of numerous plant species. When considering the scientific name of the acorn banksia, banksia, it refers to its what? Is it species, genus, class, or phylum? All right, pause the question, get it done, and then I'll go through the answer now. Um, whoops. Right. So any sort of scientific name that we're going to get is based on the Linnaean classification system. So if you are following along with your notes, this is unit one topic, sorry, unit three topic, um, the second dot point under topic one. Linnaean classification names all of its species using something called binomial nomenclature. And it follows the convention of genus followed by species, where genus is capitalized and species is not capitalized. All of the other taxa of Linnaean classification are not important when naming the different species. So immediately, I know that it's not going to be class or phylum. Now, Banksia, which is the first um, part of the name of the Avon Wheat Belt, is also capitalized, which means that we're referring to our genus or part uh, or question B. Oh, answer option B, I should say. Okay. Question seven now. A lake contains 934 brown trout, 733 small mouse base, 300, uh, sorry, 34 catfish, 2003 carp, 234 steelheads, and 32 northern pikes. Fill out the following table and calculate the SDI or Simpsons Diversity Index. This is a two mark question. So pause the um, recording and I will go through the answer. All right, so here are all of our numbers. I've got the 234 brown trout, 733, 34, 2003, 234, um, 32, 
making our total number of organisms 3,970, and then that total number multiplied by n minus 1 is 15,756,930. Then moving forward with all of the n, n times 1 numbers, I've got 8,71422 for brown trout, 1,073,112 for smallmouth base, 1,122 for catfish, uh, 4,010,006 for the carp, 54,522 for the steelheads, 992 for the northern pike, and all of those numbers added together gives us a total of 6,176. 6, Following along with that STI formula, that formula then becomes 1 minus the fraction of 6,000, uh, sorry, 6 million, 11,176 divided by 15,756,930, 15, which gives us 1 minus 0 0.38, which is 0 0.62. Um, just before we go into the next question, if you are asked to describe the biodiversity here, it's like moderately high biodiversity. I'd say moderate biodiversity is about 0 0.5 when you're halfway between 0, 0.1, 0 to 1 mark. Um, considering we're at 0 0.62, it's like slightly above average, so moderately high would be an appropriate thing to say. Okay, now we're at question eight. Um, your job is to explain the difference between species richness and species evenness and why both measurements are needed to assess biodiversity. Okay, so pause the question. Um, let's say that this one is worth three marks, actually. I'll just write on here. Three marks. Okay. Um, hopefully all of you have had a chance to unpause. If you did miss the three marks thing before you paused, go back and evaluate whether it's worth your answer is worth three marks, and then I'll go through the question now. Species richness refers to the total number of species within a population. So quite literally the abundance of spe species in the area being studied. Saying that definition, number one, is going to get you your first mark. Species evenness describes the distribution of these species or the ratios of certain populations to another. Um, that right there is going to give you your second mark. Both measurements are needed as high biodiversity is characterized, sorry, characterized, e D by a large variety of species that are evenly distributed with few dominant species. Um, basically what this is saying is that it doesn't really matter if your ecosystem has, you know, 10 species living in it, if the populations of nine of those 10 species are, make up like 5% of the population, and then the 95% of the population is made up by one. True high biodiversity is made up of multiple different species interacting together with balanced populations across all of the species numbers. Um, and the more balanced it is, the more stable. Oh, sorry guys. Uh, the more stable the ecosystem is. All right, here is question nine. Um, now this is a short response uh, worth remarks right here. A small population of Iberian lynx, Lynx pardinis, exists in parts of Spain. The Iberian lynx is critically endangered and with around 100 individuals left, it is the mo world's most endangered species of cat. The Iberian lynx and the Eurasian lynx were once classified within the same species based on their observable features. In the last 10 years, the Iberian sphinx the, the Iberian lynx has been reclassified as a separate species within the genus lynx on the basis of its phylogeny. Define the term phylogeny and explain how phylogeny is related to classification. Use the two lynx species as examples. Okay, please pause the question, get that done. Remember, it is worth three marks. And I will explain the answer now. Right, 
So first of all, I want you guys to like grab your attention towards this term define here. Now, usually when you are asked to define something in QCAA, it'll be very, very specific to the defined dot points in the QCAA syllabus. So if you haven't done so already, go through the syllabus and pick out all of the ones that are asking you to define a term. Go to the QCAA glossary and learn that definition off by heart because that'll guarantee you full marks regardless of what the rest of your answer is going to say. For this question, this is one that I've pulled from like a third party resource. So it's not super like, I don't think you'd be required to define the term phylogeny. You will, you might be asked to explain the term phylogeny instead, um, which is exactly what the second part of the question is asking you to do. Explain, on the other hand, is a cognitive verb that wants you to put a bit more detail into the response that goes beyond just like describing or defining something. You need to be able to piece together aspects of the definition to use as evidence for your answer. Um, and this time, the evidence that you're using are the two links species. So this is sort of the kind of answer that I would come up with. Number one, defining that term phylogeny. Phylogeny or phylogenetics refers to the classification of species based on the number of genetic differences in protein and molecular sequences of an organism. Two organisms that have very similar combination of alleles will be grouped together into a species and increasing different uh, genetic differences. And if this number of differences increasing it increases, the rest, the less related the organisms become. In the case of the lynxes, so this is the second part of the question here, they would have been classified originally according to morphological species concept, considering only physical traits. However, there must have been enough genetic differences between the two links when you consider phylogenetics to classify the two links as different species according to phylogeny. Um, so if you are wanting the mark breakdown here, that first mark comes from defining phylogeny. So if you've got anything along the lines of phylogeny being um, species classification based on genetics, then you would have gotten the mark. Um, and then explain how phylogeny is related to classification. Here, two organisms that would have had similar combination of alleles or similar genetic sequences would be grouped together in, into a species. And organisms with more genetic differences would be considered less related. That's your explanation of phylogeny, phylogeny in terms of classification. Your third mark comes from using the two lynx species as examples. So in the case of the lynx, if you had said that they had been classified according to morphology or the morphological species concept first, that's half of that mark, and then say that there's enough genetic differences between the two of them to be different species according to phylogeny. That makes up that third part of the mark. So you can see the, the two cognitive verbs definitely help how you structure the question. Obviously, starting with that define, explaining the definition in relation to classification, and then backing up that explanation using the two links to species. Hopefully, that uh, all makes sense. Alrighty, with that, we have arrived at the final um, top uh, question for unit three, topic one. Um, now what we're going to do is go into unit three, topic two a little bit. So this is ecosystems dynamics. If you haven't had a chance to revise this one yet, um, it's all about population ecology. So um, the ways in which populations of organisms will change depending on their interactions with the ecosystem, as well as how ecosystem changes um, happen. So all of that stuff about uh, primary and secondary succession um, is stuff that appears in this topic. Oh. Sorry, I keep yawning, guys. Um, question one for you here is one biotic factor that affects consumers in an ocean ecosystem is what? So I will give you guys a minute to do this question um, before going through the answer. Do, 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 do. Hopefully, oh yes, please pause the question, get the answer done, and then I'll go through the answer now. 
So, is it A, the number of autotrophs, B, temperature variation, C, salt content, or D, water pH? Just a bit of a recap, abiotic factors and biotic factors are basically encompass all of the things that are interacting together in an ecosystem. Biotic factors represent all of the living components of an ecosystem, and this includes things like predator-prey relationships, com competition relationships, symbiotic relationships, as well as all of the like decomposers, producer-consumer, um, anything that's related to the living aspect of an ecosystem, we're thinking biotic factors. Abiotic factors are the opposite of that, so any non-living components of the ecosystem, um, things like climate, rainfall, soil temperature, pH, etc. etc. Now, one important thing to take notice of in this question is that they're asking you an ocean system, ocean ecosystem, and then biotic factor. The only biotic factor in all of these options is a, or number of autotrophs. So that is your answer. Temperature vari variation, salt content, and water pH are all abiotic factors. So they are not the correct answer. All right, here is question number two. We've got a food web being represented with this diagram right here. Um, which population in this food web would most likely be negatively affected by an increase in the mouse population? So is it going to be the snake? Is it going to be the rabbit? Is it going to be the wolf or the hawk? Please pause the video, um, give yourself a minute to answer the question, and I will go through the answer now. Here, any time you get an increase in population negatively affecting something, it will be for a competing species for the population that increases, or any species that that population uses as a, as a food source. Any other sort of like predator will be increasing in population alongside. Ooh. Sorry, um, alongside the population that increases. For the mouse, this applies to the berry bushes. So if the mouse population increases, the berry bushes are expected to decrease because there's a higher demand from the mice for berry bushes. And also the rabbit, because it's the one species that it's competing with. So if the mouse population increases, then more of the berry bushes are going to be consumed by the mice, leaving less for the rabbit, so their population would be negatively affected in some way. Okay, next question. Question number three, I've got which of the following constitutes a community? A, two or more species of organisms in their environment. B, the interaction between living organisms and their environment. C, all of the organisms of the same or closely related species. D, two or more populations of organisms. Pause the video, get your answer done, and I will go through the answer now. Alrighty, in terms of notes, species refer to a group of similar organisms with similar genetic sequences. Two or more species of organisms in their environment is known as a population. The interaction between living organisms and their environment is an ecosystem. And all of the organisms of a same or closely related species is more similar to a population than any other of these terms. Two or more populations coming together, so two or more large groups of species, is a community. So our answer is most likely related to D. Question number four. Uh, the picture below shows an ocean bay food chain. We've got sun being consumed by kelp, then coming to sea urchins, crabs, sea ducks, and then finally arctic foxes. Sea otters move into the ocean bay. They consume all of the sea urchins. This change will likely cause the A, kelp to have less food, B, crabs to have more food, C, sea ducks to have less food, and D, arctic foxes to have more food. Have a think about this one. Give yourself a minute to answer, and I will go through the question now. So we've got sea otters coming in. They are consuming all of the sea urchins. So if sea urchins gets removed from the situation, that means that the organisms that the sea urchins that were consuming will start to increase in population. So the kelp will have a greater population because they're being consumed less. 
Crabs, on the other hand, which is what um, crabs rely on sea urchins as a source of food. If all of the sea urchins are now gone, the crabs are going to have less food. So both A and B are incorrect as the kelp doesn't have less food. The kelp has more the rates of survival because it's being predated less. B, crabs will have more food. Well, that's just incorrect. Sea ducks will have less food. Let's think about this one. If the sea urchins all die, the crabs will be left without a food source, so their population will also decrease. If the crab population decreases, then the sea ducks who are feeding on the crabs will also experience um, less food availability. So C seems to be correct so far. Arctic foxes will have more food. Well, the Arctic foxes are eating the sea ducks, which are not being able to um, feed on as many crabs. So if anything, the Arctic foxes will also have less food. And so our answer here is C. Um, so yeah, notes, um, competition for the sea urchins will decrease the number of crabs, thereby decreasing the number of sea ducks as sea ducks feed on crabs, which feed on sea urchins. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, um, next for question five, I have this short answer question. This is from the 2020 paper. Um, it's question one of paper two, and it's broken up into part A and B. Part A says, explain how a species, whoopsie, species interaction may be classified as symbiotic. And part B is saying, using an example, describe the symbiotic relationship of mutualism. All right, before we actually get into the uh, question here, I want you to, I want to go through with you guys how to approach answering this question. So our two cognitive verbs here are explain and describe. Explain means that you are not just giving your answer with superficial or like very basic level detail. You need to be pretty thorough with the response that you're going to write. A good indication of how many like points of information you need to include in your answer can be found in the number of marks for the question. So this is a two mark question, part A. You need to be giving two separate details about what specifically makes a symbiotic relationship or how symbiotic relationships are classified. It's the same thing with part B. This time around, you're wanting two different marks here. For this one, it's a little bit easier. Um, I guess you could say the description of mutualism would be worth one mark in this case. And then using the correct example to back up your description would be worth the second. Um, so that being said, hopefully all of you have either written the answer already or pause now and write the answer to the question. And I will go through the marking scheme right now. Right here. So this is literally what the two mark question is worth. Number one is that symbiotic relationships are long-term relationships between two or more organisms. You got in the marking guide for this question, you got one mark for saying that it was for two or more organisms and one completely other mark for saying that it was a long-term relationship. Now, if you didn't include either one of the italicized or highlighted details, you would have lost a mark in this question. As for part B, Mutualism is a relationship between two animals where both animals benefit, like a partnership between sea anemone and a clownfish. Now, all in all, writing this first sentence that I've written to you would be enough to get you the two marks. Um, but I've just got in here for like learning's sake, clownfish receives shelter from a sea anemone and a sea anemone receives nutrients from the clownfish. If any of you have done this question and you want me to check any of your responses, pop them in the chat and I'll um, answer you and give you any feedback on what I think you can improve on. Other than that, see if you can pop in any other examples of um, mutualism relationships and I can check them off for you as well. You could have also said the um, like the white bird and the bull, where the white bird picks off all of the ticks off of the cow's back and the cow benefits as well. For, for like The white bird gains nutrients because they have a food source and the cow benefits by ridding itself of parasites. You could have also said that. I'm trying to think of any others. Um, if not, pop them in the chat and I can mark them off for you if you so desire. All right, question number six. 
is a six mark question also from a paper two. So this is technically classified as an extended response question. Um, I've only given you the, oops, I've only given you the um, part A of this question, which is worth two marks. And it's an ecologist investigated the species composition of mangrove trees in a natural mangrove forest and an adjacent 30 year old planted mangrove forest. Three, 10 meter wide belt transects were sampled from inland to the sea of each of the forests, each covering 100 meters on average and placed to cover various strata. The species diversity of forest A was determined using the Simpsons Diversity Index, SDI, and the formula is given to you in the question itself. The good thing about biology is that because they don't give you a, a formula sheet, um, any necessary formulas that you need to know will usually be given to you in the question itself. And here's your population count. Forest A is our natural forest um, with three different, sorry, four different types of species, gray mangrove, red mangrove, river mangroves, and orange mangroves. Your part A is required to calculate the SDI for forest B, and this is a two mark question of the six marks. So please pause, give yourself uh, two minutes to answer this question and I'll go through the answer now. Anytime you're asked to use a formula, um, and this goes across all of your subjects, so keep this in mind for you know methods, chemistry, et cetera, et cetera as well. Um, always write out the formula and show the substitution Never just go straight to the the answer with these kinds of things. Um, oftentimes they'll be worth like two or three marks and you will get marks purely for working. If you miss out writing down that working step, you could lose marks for an answer that you end up getting correct in the, in the end. So this is what they've given you in the marking guide. Number one is the substitution of all of the values. So one minus 77 times 77 minus one for the gray mangrove plus 14 times 13 for the red mangrove, plus eight times seven for the river mangrove. Um, this orange mangrove, because its abundance is zero, you do not need to do zero times negative one, because technically speaking, it's not a species that exists in the um, population. It's, it's not one that exists. Ooh. Sorry about that. Um, and so if we get one minus this entire fraction, please use a calculator for this, you end up with 0 0.37. One mark for the correct substitution into the equation and one mark for stating that the SDI is the correct SDI. Alrighty, here is part B and C of the um, same question. Identify three reasons why the ecologist used a belt transect rather than line transects or randomly placed placed quadrats for collecting data to compare these two forests. And part C, identify one way in which the ecologist minimized bias in the sampling. Now this is a three mark question and a one mark question here. And we've got identify three reasons. Pretty easy to work out where these marks are coming from. You have to, so it's one mark per reason that you state. And then identify one way in which um, bias was minimized, that's also just one mark per question. So pause the video now, pause the recording, um, get an answer written for the um, question and I will go through the answer with you. Alrighty, so this is what QCAA is sort of expecting of you. Beltline transects are used to get the abundance and distribution of species. So what that basically means in plain English is that they're looking for the numbers and populations of species, as well as what areas of the, or what parts of the area being studied are these species most likely to be um, found in. So let's say if we were doing a Beltline transect and we found that one species represents like 90% of the population, but they only were found in two of the 10 transects calculated, then you can say that there are very, very high abundance species with a really small distribution um, for their like habitat. Um, the reason why this is important, or you can only get this kind of information from a beltline transect, is because 
Random quadrats can be used for abundance or finding the numbers of species because again, they're just squares and you're counting up all of the species in that like one quadrat, but not distribution. So um, another thing that you can use, like what distribution means is finding environmental gradients as well. So seeing how abiotic factors can change over the course of a line transect. Random quadrats give you no insight into that. So that is one reason why Beltline transects can be favored across um, random transects. Line transects, on the other hand, only assess distribution, but not abundance. Because again, when you're doing line transect sampling, you're only taking into account everything that's touching the line. Even if there's a new species that's lying literally one and a half meters away from the line transect, you are not allowed to count that because you're only counting the ones that are touching whatever the line transect is. So line transects can be used for distribution, but not abundance. Random sampling doesn't take into account any strata or different areas and may not cover all of the areas of the habitat equally, giving inaccurate measures of diversity and abundance. So there you go. There's your three reasons. Number one is that beltline transects are used for abundance and distribution of the species. Number two is that if you were to use line transects or randomly placed quadrats, you wouldn't get both distribution and, and abundance. And number three, stratified sampling through a beltline transect also takes into account the strata or different areas of an ecosystem so that your values for distribution and abundance that you're collecting are accurate. That's your third reason. As for identify one way which, when, in which the ecologist minimized bias in the sampling, the locations of the beltline transects were chosen to take strata into account. That could have given you the mark. You could have also said that any of the equipment used would have been properly calibrated. That could also have given you a mark. Um, randomly placing down the beltline transects to cover the strata, that could have given you a mark. Any of the sort of minimized bias um, methods could would have easily given you the mark needed for this question. Okay, well that's question six. Moving on to question seven. Um, this one is another paper two question. It's a four mark question. This time we're looking at species richness can be determined using the Menhinex index, where s like lowercase s is the number of different species represented in the sample and n is the total number of individual organisms in the sample. Species richness is equal to s divided by the square root of n. Sampling has occurred in two communities. We've got community A and community B, where community A was known to have an s value of 0.5 for the six species that were identified. The results for community B are shown in the table below, where we've got species A to F and then the number of individuals for each of them. What you've got to do is use the capital S value to compare community A with community B. Now, just before we get into the question, compare has a very, very specific meaning in the QCAA. Compare goes beyond your contrast. So if you ever see contrast, it literally just means to identify similarities and differences. Compare goes beyond that, where you need to talk about the similarities and differences between two groups, but also attribute a significance to them or a reason why these, uh, the similarities and differences exist. So that being said, it's a four mark question. You need to be including four steps or four pieces of information somewhere to get four marks. Um, keeping in mind, you've got to give a reason for any similarities and differences you state. So that being said, please pause the uh, recording and give yourself four minutes to complete this question. And I will go through the answer um, very soon. Okay. Number one, what we can do is use this formula to find out what capital S or species richness for community B is going to be able to. So our number of different species, A through to F is six. So we've got six here and then divided by the total number of species here. So 12 plus 15 plus 19 plus 22 plus 25 plus seven gives us a square root of 100. So our species richness is gonna be six times by 10 or sorry, six divided by 10 or 0 0.6. 
Now, our first difference that we can say is the S value for community B is larger than the S value for community A. Community B has a greater species richness than community A. However, community A and community B have the same six species identified. So we need to use a reason or find the significance behind why community A's S value is larger than community B's Sorry, why community B's S value is larger than community A's, even though they have the same number of species? Well, community B has the same number of species as community A. However, A must have the larger sample size. And we can actually use this, um, use the same formula to prove this. If we say that community A's S value is 0 0.5, and that was equal to the number of species in community A, which is 6, divided by the square root of capital N, I can solve for whatever N was equal to using this formula. So square root of N then becomes 6 divided by 0 0.5, which is equal to 12. Here. Then N would be equal to 12 squared, like so, which is equal to 144. There, we've just proven that community A's sample size of 144 is larger than community B's sample size of 100. And that is the significant statement you need to get full marks in this question. Just if you are interested in the mark breakdown, you get one mark for solving S properly and one mark for doing the substitution properly into the equation, one mark for saying that community B has greater richness than community A, and one mark for saying why this is, even though they have the same number of species, and it's because community A has the larger sample. There you go. Oh, all right. Okay, this is the next question I have for you guys. Classify the following relationships according to one of the terms below. So we've got parasitism, um, competition, predation, mutualism, and commensalism. You've got one, two, three, four, five uh, little questions here. So if you give yourself five minutes to answer this question, honestly, you could probably get it done a little bit quicker than that. Uh, but pause the video, get the question done, and... I will go through the answer now. Uh, just before we go through the answer, I do want to run by each of these different um, species interactions. So parasitism is a type of symbiotic relationship where one of the species is benefiting um, and the other one is getting harmed. The benefited species is often called the parasite, hence parasitism, and the harmed species is usually called the host because the parasite attacks the host and uses the host's um, functions for their own well-being and benefit. Competition, on the other hand, is a biotic relationship, not a symbiotic, just a regular biotic relationship where two organisms are competing for the same resource. You can have inter-specific competition where two different species are competing for the same shelter, food, resources, etc. Or you can also have intra-specific competition where this is um, organisms of the same species competing for the same mates, food, resources, etc. Et Predation is another biotic relationship where one species is hunting and killing the other species for food. The hunting species is the predator, the hunted species is the prey. Mutualism is a type of symbiotic relationship. We just covered this where both of the organisms are benefiting. And compensalism is a symbiotic relationship where one of the species is benefiting and the other one remains unharmed. So that being said, cellulose, digesting bacteria, feeding in a cow's stomach. So in this time round, cellulose digesting bacteria would be able to break down the plant cell walls that of the grass that the um, cow is consuming. Once again, remember, cellulose is the thing that is making up plant cell walls. So it would help the cow's um, cow digest its food 
and the bacteria would also receive a food source. So both of these organisms are benefiting and thus the relationship is mutualism. In this one, a cat attacking and consuming a rosella. We've got the predator cat attacking and using the rosella as a food source. This is consumption or predation. A lichen plant consisting of an association between algae and a, fung uh, a fungus. What this basically means is that lichen plants are um, formed by the partnership between an algae and a fungus. The Fungus is able to make the body of the plant and decompose things as a nutrient basis. And the algae is able to photosynthesize and give energy and food to the plant as well. So this is a mutually beneficial relationship between the two of them. They share the lichens like biomass, and this is mutualism. Part D, uh, a eucalypt and an acacia are using similar resources in a savanna woodland. Um, if they're using similar resources, then oftentimes they have to compete for them, so the relationship is competition. A shrimp given protection from predators by living in the tentacles of a sea anemone. Here, the shrimp is uh, benefiting from the sea anemone because it's being given protection, but the anemone isn't really receiving anything back from the shrimp, um, but it's also not harmed. So this is commensalism as our relationship. Okay. I think I've got, yes, I've got one more question for you with um, this unit, and then we're going into unit four. So my final one for this one is explain how process of classifying ecosystems is an important step towards effective ecosystem management of productive soils. Um, for this one, I want to give you three marks. Cool. Three marks. And that's three minutes on the clock. So if you can pause and get that done, great. All right. This is how I would have gone about answering this question. Number one, you've got to explain the importance of classifying ecosystems, number one. And then two, the that, that'll get you your first mark. The following two marks from uh, come from specific updates about of specific details about management of productive soils. So here, classification allows us to document, monitor, and communication communicate information about biodiversity, which can be used to monitor how productive soils can recover after agriculture. If you don't know what productive soils are, they are these massive um, fields of soil that are very, very nutrient rich and very, very fertile. Um, because of this, they are super convenient for agriculture and um, naturally speaking, they very, very, uh, it's very difficult to erode, erode um, productive soils. Unfortunately, if you use them in agriculture for like farming purposes, they can become much weaker because the agricultural crops that you're using, usually they're genetically uh, engineered to be identical. So they're using up all of the in nutrients in the productive soils and usually will make them erode a little bit faster as well. So um, the reason why classifying ecosystems is important is if you identify one ecosystem as a productive soil ecosystem and come up with a plan to protect it against um, like erosion and soil nutrient deficiency, if you find another ecosystem that is a productive soil, you can share the management plan and the entire process becomes a lot more streamlined. Um, so you don't need to spend the same amount of time like experimenting with things. So an example of that is management for the reduction, sorry, of overgrazing and soil erosion prevention strategies. Classification can also be used to identify which parts of an area have similar species composition and abiotic factors. So this data can then be used to inform effective management as similar management principles could apply to, oops, I should say, productive soils with similar species competition, composition. Oh, 
Oh, it's so hard to type things using trackpad. There we go. Productive soils with similar species competition, uh, composition. Um, so your first mark comes from just explaining how classification can help with um, ecosystems. Number one, communicating and documenting information. And then number two, identifying ecosystems with similar composition. Um, and then your two examples come from reduction of overgrazing and then using management principles with um, previous productive soils to manage future productive soils with similar species. Okay, now we come on to unit four, topic one. I know that that's been a lot of um, questions so far, so I'll let you guys take a little break. Um, if you come back in, uh, pause the video, come back in like five to 10 minutes, and then I will resume things. I've just got to get a drink of water very, very quickly. Um, Ooh. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, sitting and talking at a laptop for two hours on end can get very strenuous on the throat. Anyway, um, going forward, we've got Unit Four, Topic One. This is DNA genes and the continuity of life. Um, here is your first question. Which of the following is a base that is found in RNA but not in DNA? Um, again, minute to answer the question, pause, and when you're back with the answer, um, here are my notes first. In DNA, so this is deoxyribonucleic acid. This is our double-stranded helix. Um, that is the main storage molecule for all of the genetic information in organisms. Um, every single one of our DNA sequences, every single one of our genes is comprised of four base pairs um, that are joined together by hydrogen bonds. Each of the base pairs has their own complement. So we've got our adenine and thymine, or A and T, which join together, and guanine and cytosine, or G and C, which join together. And the reason why it's important to know that they're joined together by hydrogen bonds is that once we need to access those genes, we need to break apart the two double helix strands so that that gene sequence can be copied. In order to create a molecule that can be broken apart, you need a bond that's strong enough to hold them together as a molecule, but also weak enough for an enzyme to break them and then release the DNA sequence. And hydrogen bonds allow DNA to do exactly that. RNA, on the other hand, is a single-stranded genetic molecule. Um, it's ribonucleic acid, and it doesn't have any sort of the double helix. Um, it's just a single helix that um, wraps around. In this case, though, RNA, the thymine base pair is replaced by uracil, which bonds with adenine, and then guanine and cytosine remain the same. They bond together as well. So which of the following is found in RNA but not in DNA? Oh, oopsie. Our answer is uracil. Right here. Question number two. Which type of bonds hold the complementary base pairs together? All right. Plus, I might have teased the answer to this question in the previous ex uh, explanation, but pause the question, get the answer done, and have a go. All right, so here's my explanation. 
Complementary base pairs in DNA are held together by hydrogen bonds, which again, the reason why it's hydrogen bonds is that they're strong enough to hold the structure of the double helix together, but weak enough to be broken by helicase to unravel the helix during things like DNA replication and protein synthesis. Now, one important thing to note here is that hydrogen bonds are not actually bonds within the molecule itself. It's an intermolecular bond, not an intramolecular bond. Um, now, that'll be much more relevant if any of you watching the stream are doing chemistry. But for those people who are just doing biology, that piece of information is not relevant to you at all. Now, the sugar phosphate backbone, on the other hand, so the thing that's connecting the actual strand of DNA together, is held together by the covalent bonds, which are much, much stronger. So if you remember the structure of a nucleotide, it is a deoxyribose sugar bonded to a phosphate and then bonded to a nitrogenous base. The sugar and the um, phosphate group, uh, that bond holding to the, them together is much stronger than the bond holding the two bases together between adjacent strands. So our question, what type of bond holds complementary bases together? We are talking hydrogen bonds. Um, just to actually go through the responses as well, physical bonds isn't even a thing. Sugar bonds, it's not quite, quite correct. And then none of the above is also incorrect. So you could also come to this conclusion by process of elimination too. Alrighty, this is question number three. Use a, the codon table, which is provided right here for you, to determine the amino acid sequence for the following. Recall that synthesis can only occur between the start and the stop codon. So they've given you a little bit of a hint there, not going to lie. This is your DNA strand. You are required to form the mRNA strand and the protein. Um, and this is a full total of three marks here. Right. Um, for any of you who are wondering, um, anytime you're required to translate a DNA into a protein sequence, um, that codon table is going to be given to you in your exam paper. You will not be needed to memorize what the start and stop codons are. They will be told to you. Um, so with that being said, give yourself about two to three minutes to answer this question and come back for the explanation for said question. Ooh. Da, 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 da. All right. First, we're going to find our mRNA strand. So we've got CCT, which forms GGA, CTT, GAA, TAC, AUG, ACA, UGU, CGG, GCC, AGG, UCC. Oh my goodness, my... I think I said CC and Siri on my phone is dictating what I'm saying now. Um, AGG, UCC, GTA becomes CAU, GCG, uh, G, CGC becomes GCG, TAT, um, AUA, TCT, AGA, ATG is UAC, ATT is UAA, ACA is U, that's such a G. And you, CGG is GCC, uh, TTG is AAC, CGA is GCU, and TCC is AGG. Now what you've got to do is match up all of those codons to the um, adjacent uh, amino acid. So the way that this is kind of organized is the first codon is the one on the um, like if you're going use, all the U's are in this top column, all the C's are in this next one, A's and then G's. And then the second codon is the vertical column. And then the third codon is just the one within the box. So if I've got G, G, A, I'm going G, G, uh, and then A here. And this should be forming a glycine. But something that you need to mention, uh, something that you need to realize is that we haven't started the start, we haven't come to the start codon yet, so we can't start the amino acid until then. Then when we come to GAA, we're going GAA, 
aspenine, oh, sorry, glue, but again, no start codon, so we're not starting the protein sequence yet. We've got AUG, so that's A, oops, that's, wait, I'll use a laser pointer for this so I'm not drawing everywhere. Um, I've got AUG, MET is our start codon. So I've got gly and glue here, which are our um, not so relevant ones. And then MET is the next, uh, MET is the proper codon that the actual protein sequence starts with. Then we end up with U, G, U, cis, G, C, or G, C, C, ALA, U, C, C, serine, C, A, U, is his, oh, that should not say leucine. Whoopsie, that should say his. Uh, C U C C is serine. C A U, yeah, that is definitely not L U U. That's his. Sorry about that, guys. Um, G C G, G C G is ALA. Yep. Um, A U A. A is I guess I'll put this I L E. And then A G A is ARG, and then U A G is the stop codon right here. So you only need to translate this from start, which is met, to stop codon, and then this continuation on the protein sequence does not need to be translated for you to get the correct mark for this question. Alrighty, question number five. In dragons, the ability to breathe fire is a recessive trait. Homozygous dominant dragons cannot produce fire or smoke at all. Heterozygous dragons can only produce smoke but no fire. Um, cross breed across a fire breathing dragon with a homozygous dominant dragon. What would the genotype and the phenotype ratios for this offspring be? Alrighty, this for this one, I would say that this is a full mark question. So give yourself about four minutes to do it. Honestly, people can get it done in much quicker than four minutes. But pause the video and have a go at filling in the table. Well, I go through the answer. All right, number one, I'm gonna find out what all of the genotypes are. You get one mark for doing this properly. If your fire, um, if your dragon is breathing fire, we are ending up with a double um, recessive or a little f, little f. I've just chosen f for this case because it coincides with fire breath pretty well, but you could do any letter you want. Um, Non-fire breathing is homozygous dominant, so double F, double F. And then smoke or heterozygous, that should say capital F, little f. I think autocorrect might have been turned off in this case. Capital F, little f. So if you've got those three, um, uh, do, 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 do. yeah, if you've got those three uh, genotypes, then you would have gotten one mark. The second mark comes from doing the Punnett square properly. So we're crossing a fire breathing dragon or a double recessive right here, little f, little f, with a non fire breathing um, homozygous dominant dragon. So we've got double f, double capital F there. All of our offspring are going to be capital F, little f. So our Genotypic ratio is going to be 100% capital F, little f, or 100% heterozygous. Um, and our phenotypic ratio is 100% smoke, but no fire. So if you've got all four of those details, that's four marks down pat for this question. Okay, question number six, I've got what are the three types of mutations? Describe each and provide an analysis of their potential effects on the protein encoded by the gene mutated. Once again, we've got describe here. So all you've got to do is give a description, give the detail required about each of the um, mutations. 
you do not need to go beyond that. It does say provide an analysis, but all you've got to say is like state the percent potential effect. Let's say that this is a three mark question. So for each of the mutations, you get one mark. Give yourself uh, three minutes, pause the recording and go on with the answer. Our first type of mutation is called a point mutation. Hold on, let me get up the laser pointer again. Point mutation. This is where a single nucleotide is changed. We can also call this a single nucleotide polymorphism. Point mutations are also called substitution mutations, where one nucleotide is basically swapped for another. Um, the effect of a point or a substitution mutation um, is determined by the swapped codon. Sometimes they can have an effect because it changes the amino acid that is coded for, but usually there can be no effect as only one codon is affected. So of the entire protein synthesis, uh, of the entire protein sequence, either one amino acid changes or it doesn't even change at all and the protein ends up being virtually the same. However, with frame shift mutations, and there are two types of uh, frame shift mutations here, um, they can be insertion, so a, a base pair could be put in or a base pair could be deleted, which is a deleted mutation. Of one or more nucleotides dislocated, um, dislocating the translation reading frame. This effect is much larger as all codons from the point of the mutation are affected, um, causing the change to the entire protein unless the frame shift mutation occurs for a multiple of three base pairs. So in this case, I'll just explain what that means. If your mutation affects a multiple of three base pairs, that means that an exact number of codons, so either three or four codons will be inserted or three or four codons will be deleted. If your mutation is more than three, like more than a multiple of three base pairs, then the entire protein sequence changes and you won't be able to recover any of the original codons that would have been um, produced in the protein had there been no mutation. So sometimes this can be a good thing, but sometimes it can be a bad thing. Overall, the effect of insertion or deletion mutations are much, much larger than point or substitution mutations. Okay, question number seven. What is a Hox gene? Give one example in Drosophila melanogaster for a mutation in a Hox gene causing a phenotype of interest. Just to break down this question a little bit, if you haven't interacted with the syllabus already, this is under the gene expression topic. And Hox genes, uh, I'll wait until the actual answer, but this is um, stated in the syllabus as an example of a type of Hox gene. Um, let's say that this is a two mark question. Give yourself about two minutes um, to write a response and then I'll go through the answer with you guys. All right, Hox genes are a type of transcription factor responsible for the patterning of the body in most organisms. One example of the Hox gene is the malfunction in the gene. You don't need to know, and um, you don't need to know this in too much detail. But one example of the Hox gene is for the thorax segment of Drosophila melanogaster. So this is a typical fruit fly. When this gene is normally expressed, it is done so that the um, all of the segments of the fly are going to develop in a normal way. So it causes legs and other structures to develop out of the thorax. If the gene has a mutation, um, for example, if it's missing expressed in the head of the fly instead of the thorax of the fly, it can cause antenna that would typically form in the head to instead develop in the legs. Um, another way of writing the answer to this question could just be Hox genes are transcription factors or specific genes that code for transcription factors that are responsible for the location of cell tissue formation. They ensure that body parts during the developmental stages of um, organisms, so in this case the fruit fly, are going to grow in the correct position, um, in the correct orientation. If there is a mutation in an Hox gene, it will start 
the development of body parts or the development of limbs in incorrect um, parts of the body, which is what we see here where legs are developing outside of the head or antenna are developing from the thorax um, instead of the other way around. And the other kind of gene or the other kind of transcription factor that you guys need to know is something called the SRY gene, um, which oh, we might talk about it later on. If not, I'll go back to this question and do the SRY gene. As for question eight, um, fill out all of the following information regarding polymerase chain reaction. So this is from our biotechnology topic. Ooh. Biotech. Let's say that this is an eight mark question, one for each of these boxes. Um, give it a crack and Unpause the recording when you guys are done. All right. Step one of um, PCR is basically where you get the sample of DNA that needs to be um, replicated and you denature the hydrogen bonds between the double helix strands so that both of the strands separate out. Instead of um, this happening in a natural way, so usually we use the enzyme um, DNA helicase to do that in DNA replication. Because biotechnologies are all man-made, we kind of have alternate methods of doing that. So this time around, we're going to heat it up to a really, really high temperature, usually about 95 degrees Celsius, so that the hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds break on their own and the DNA then splits into single strands. The reason why this is necessary is it causes the original copy of the target gene to split into two templates that, that can then be replicated into additional copies. Remember, the whole purpose of um, PCR is to rapidly copy multiple, um, sorry, to rapidly create multiple copies of DNA. So splitting the DNA into single strands makes a template for duplication of the target gene. Then step number two is our annealing process. This time around, we drop the temperature and it's a priming step. So we have all of these RNA primers that are included in this solution that bind to the DNA. They basically act as like a starting point. It's like, this is the starting point. This is the ending point of the target gene. Everything in between is what needs to be copied. So it adds the primers that are required by polymerase to start and stop replication. Step number three is extension. So this time around, we, if you remember from DNA replication, the enzyme that was doing the actual replication step, so adding all of the complementary bases on, was called DNA polymerase. In PCR, we use a special type of polymerase that comes from a bacteria that's super, super resistant to heat. And so we heat up the... Um, sample once again to a very high temperature and this time tack polymerase or you can just say polymerase it's not too too um no, qcw is not too too fussed with the numbers but if you want the correct term it's tack polymerase t-a-q polymerase copies the dna template by adding all of the nuclear uh, like the complementary base pairs to the um, template strands so why is this necessary? It creates a new copy of DNA. And suddenly from the two template, template strands, you've got two copied pieces of DNA, um, which then repeat. So those two copied pieces of DNA then split again and are recopied. So every cycle of PCR, you multiply your original number of strands by two. And you repeat this for as many times you like, and it allows for the creation of many copies of DNA in a very small amount of time. Um, now, usually two to the power of N is the amount of copies that you'll end up with, where N is the number of cycles that you run PCR for. Okay. Final question for, I think this is the final question. Yes, for um, unit four, topic one. Describe two ways in which the process of sex determination in humans can produce an individual whose biological sex does not match their genotype. All right, this is sort of related to what I was talking about when we were doing Hox genes, but um, it's asking for the description of two ways, so I'll make this a two-mark question. 
So give yourself two minutes, pause the recording, have a go at answering the question, and then I'll walk you through your answer. So in the gene expression topic for the syllabus, it asks you to find two specific examples of transcription factors. The first one that you need to know is about homeobox genes or Hox genes, which are about the um, morphology or like the correct placement of tissue formation. Um, basically, it's a transcription factor that activates all of the genes for making like limbs and organs in the correct position. The second kind of transcription factor that is important for you to know is the one that actually forms those tissues in the first place. So an example of that is the SRY gene. Sex is determined by the presence or the lack of the sex determining region of Y or the SRY gene. And typically this is a gene that is expressed on the Y chromosome that encodes for transcription factors that turn turns on the genes that um, start forming male sex organs. So individuals with a genotype of XY are typically male because they have the gene that turns on the formation of male sex organs. Whereas those with the genotype of XX are typically female because they don't have that gene. Um, they just end up um, developing the default like female sex organ characteristics. If an animal with the genotype, or sorry, if an individual with the genotype of XY has a mutated Y chromosome that is missing or defective for the SRY gene, this individual will develop um, female sex organs even though their chromosomes are XY. This is because the SRY gene encodes for transcription factors that promote the development of male features and suppress the development, sorry, of female features. Um, alternatively, you can also get an individual with genotype XX developing male features if during recombination, the SRY gene from the father is transferred to the Y chromosome, um, sorry, from the Y chromosome of the father to the X chromosome in, in some capacity. Um, and so that's another way, along with like aneuploidy, if you remember what that is, um, that intersex individuals can come about, uh, about uh, biologically. So that brings us to, this brings us to our final um, topic. So this is unit four, topic two, continue and life on earth. This is all about evolution, microevolution, speciation, etc., etc. So question one, over a period of years, the average rainfall in an area decreases, causing environmental changes. Most likely to survive these environmental changes environmental changes is a population with a great number of genetic variation, B, with a very little genetic variation, C, that has been altered through artificial selection, or D, with the smallest population size. Oh, whoops. I was going to say, pause the question, answer it, and here's the explanation. Um, with any environmental change, the populations that remain most resilient are those with highest genetic diversity. This is because a greater variety of alleles could mean that there's a trait within the population that could improve the rates of survival after a change. So any type of great amount of genetic variation is going to help with survival. And so our answer becomes A here. Oh, whoops. Whoa. Answer becomes A. Moving on to question two. Um, according to Darwin's theory of evolution, how do new species evolve? Uh, so is it A, artificial selection, B, random chance, C, natural selection, or D, unnatural selection? Um, pause the video, have a go at answering the question, and here is your explanation. So Darwin's theory of evolution follows the principle of survival of the fittest. Um, another name for this is natural selection. And what he basically stated in this principle is that organisms that have traits that are suited to surviving in their environment are going to survive and pass them on to the offspring. But the thing is, in any population, there's going to be a natural amount of variation caused by, you know, dominant and recessive alleles, um, mutations, um, gene flow, that kind of thing. And at the end of the day, those who survive are the ones with the positive traits, and they will be passed on to their offspring. 
um, through successive generations. So artificial selection, option A, is where humans will actually intervene and pick out the traits that they think are the most um, beneficial and then artificially breed the, oh, well, you can either artificially breed them or genetically modify them um, to produce individuals with those hand-selected traits. Unfortunately, that is not how evolution works in real life, so A is not our correct answer. Random chance is a different way that species evolved called um, genetic drift. So this is where some kind of natural disaster happens where there isn't enough time for natural selection and the selection of like favorable alleles to take place. So the surviving population after that is completely random as to whether or not they contain like helpful alleles or not. So genetic drift is the one with um, random chance. It's not actually Darwin's theory of evolution. Natural selection, which is our correct answer. See if you selected that, well done. And then unnatural selection is not even a thing. So part uh, option D is not an option that we can have. Question three. In the ocean surrounding Ant Antarctica, there are fish that survive the cold water by using a molecule made of glycoproteins that circulates the blood and keeps it from freezing. Certain kinds of worms that live in the Arctic Ocean also makes antifreeze proteins that help them survive in icy water. This is, a, this is an example of divergent, convergent, coevolution, or none of the above. Have a go at answering, and here is your explanation. So first of all, um, I've got a couple of questions lined up about divergent, convergent, or the, the diversification patterns. I'm just going to do the explanation once, um, like, of all of them. But divergent evolution is where you get two organisms that have come from a common ancestor at one point in time and then evolved to look very different and have very different traits because they've traveled to different environments or have been brought up in different environmental conditions. So their differences are entirely based on their environment rather than the original genes that came from their common ancestor. Convergent evolution, on the other hand, is the opposite of that. So here we've got two completely unrelated organisms who have evolved to form very similar characteristics because they've lived in the same environment for a very, very long time. Parallel in evolution is where one um, there are two organisms that have come from a common ancestor, but they've evolved to live in a very similar environment, so they form similar features as a result. Um, Coevolution is two unrelated organisms that are related, sorry, two unrelated organisms that are in a relationship of some kind. And as time goes on, they help each other evolve. So if there's a change or an, uh, a modification in one of them, there'll usually be a change by the other. So they evolve together, basically. In this case, we're, we're dealing with worms and we're dealing with fish. So two completely different classes of organisms that have both evolved to find glycoproteins that keep it from freezing. This is an example of two different organisms forming similar characteristics or convergent evolution. Here we've got ants are always the correct size and weight needed to open the flowers for the peony plant. The plant provides food for the ant and the ant fertilizes the peony flowers. This is an example of divergent, convergent, coevolution, or none of the above. Okay. And this one, again, it's the same kind of diversification patterns, but this time around we've got two organisms that are in a relationship of some kind. The ants are needed to open the flowers and the flowers provide food for the ant. They are in a relationship and they are going to be evolving together because both of them help each other's survival. So this would be co-evolution. All right, question five. Ostriches are native to the savannas of Africa, while penguins live in the polar regions. Although ostriches and penguins are closely related, they look very, very different. This is an example of divergent, convergent, coevolution, or none of the above. 
Again, same for diversification patterns, but this time I've got ostriches and penguins, which are two kinds of birds. They came from that one, you know, um, bird common ancestor. I'm trying, I was trying to find like the group name for, you know, how like feline, canine is like the group name for cats and dogs. I can't remember the one. Aviary, common ancestor. There we go. Um, however, they have evolved to be very, very different in appearance and behaviors. So that's an, uh, that's an example of divergent evolution and is a result of them living in extremely different environmental conditions. Though I would have to say both ostriches and penguins do not fly, they are flightless birds. So perhaps there was like an aviary, a flightless aviary common ancestor that they would have both um, occurred from, you know, somewhere down the line. Okay. Oh, if you remember a couple of uh, a couple of questions ago, me talking about genetic drift. Um, this question is to compare the concepts of gene flow and genetic drift in how they change the variation within a population. So once again, compare is a cognitive verb that requires you to point out the similarities and differences, but also explain the significance of. So I'm thinking that this would end up being like a five, six mark question, if anything. Um, I just got five marks. So if you wanted to give yourself around five minutes to write a response to this one, um, that, or I would expect about five different pieces of information in your response. So yeah, pause the video, have a go at answering the question. And here is my explanation. Um, I don't actually expect you to have written something as extensive as this. I kind of just wanted to give you all of the information on gene flow and genetic drift because I know that a lot of students will get confused between the two of them. Basically, gene flow is purely the movement of alleles between different populations um, through immigration and emigration. So if you've got two populations that are sort of close to each other in location, the flow of alleles between the two of them through breeding of populations happens because one of those organisms is moving to the other eco um, the other location and sharing alleles. If a new allele that's brought into a population via gene flow is beneficial, then it will start to increase that allele's frequency and become more expressed. So here, individuals leaving a population may change the genetic composition of a population if, by random chance, the emigrating individual's genetic composition is dissimilar to the composition of the in original population. What that's basically saying is that if the um, organisms that are leaving a population have very unique genes, it's going to stuff up the allele frequencies of the original population because now the one individual that contained that unique allele has gone. Um, and the emigrating and immigrating individuals are usually leaving or entering an ecosystem for uh, entering a population from random chance. Similarly, individuals entering a population may change the genetic composition of the population if their composition is dissimilar to the population they are entering. What that was basically saying is that if there is an individual that comes into a population with entirely new genes and is able to um, interbreed with them successfully, they can introduce new alleles into the original population and change the allele frequencies. This can result in sudden changes to the phenotype and genotypic ratios for a population. The effect of gene flow is much stronger on smaller populations and virtually non-existent for larger populations due to its reliance on chance. So larger populations are usually much more genetically diverse and a little bit more stable. So one or two entering individuals isn't going to rock things up too much, whereas smaller populations have a smaller gene pool in the, um, in the first place. So any new genes that enter will have a greater effect overall. Um, genetic drift, on the other hand, is divided into its two effects. The first one is the bottlenecking effect, and the second one is the founder effect. The founder effect 
is the kind of genetic drift that is similar to gene flow, which is why so many people get confused. But this time round, instead of a population willingly parting from its original population, a small portion of the population is separated from the main body of the population by a separate event. So there is some kind of natural disaster or is there is some kind of like stimulus that splits off a population into a very small surviving group and a larger main population. In this event, if the separated population is not representative of the original population, it can result in once that new like small population has had a chance to interbreed and grow in size a little bit, a new population that is genetically very different to the original. Um, so let's say that there are three different alleles within an original population. That surviving population only has one allele. So once they grow and once they interbreed back into the, their original size, they will only contain 30% of the gen genetic diversity as their original like mother population. And the ratios of alleles that go towards that little surviving group are completely like up to random chance every time. The bottlenecking effect, in the other hand, is where a natural disaster occurs that causes the death of a large portion of the population. So just so you don't get them confused, founder effect is where some kind of stimulus breaks the population into a small surviving population and the main population. Bottlenecking effect is where a natural disaster or a stimulus kills off most of them with a small surviving population. If the individuals that survive the event are not representative of the original population, once the population has expanded again, it could be genetically very different. Overall, both genetic drift and gene flow are extremely dependent on chance, but the main difference is that gene flow can occur continually between two populations over time, whereas genetic drift is spontaneous, caused by a stimulus, and it can't be reversed. So, if you have any major questions about that, pop them in the chat. I'll try and explain it a little bit better using examples, but hopefully that makes sense. All right, I think, yes, this is my final question for you guys. Um, question seven, this is a paper two question, I think from the 2020 external paper. Um, it's worth six marks, so I'm expecting six different details or six different pieces of information. Um, the image shows changes in the frequency of a particular gene in a single species of bird, leading to a speciation event. Um, these changes have occurred over a period of successive time points. So you've got time point one, two, and three, um, each separated by approximately a thousand generations. The letters A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D represent separate niches inhabited by the birds, and the arrows depict the gene flow between each of its niches. Um, the allelic frequency for the gene is shown as F in each of these niches right here. Draw a conclusion about the type of speciation that has occurred in this population. Explain your reasoning by referring to the information provided in each of the time points. So this is a hard question. It's not, not an easy one to answer, but um, have a crack at it and I will explain what is happening here. Whew. This is a lot of talking that I've just done. But a lot of talk. What you basically want to identify first is what is happening to the gene flow across all of the time points. So at time point one, if you look at all of these arrows indicating gene flow, um, there is gene flow happening between every single one of these niches and the allele frequencies are kind of constant. So it's staying at about 0 0.8 to 0 0.85. Then at time point two, we see that gene flow between C and D has completely stopped. So they are no longer interacting with genes and the allele frequencies for A, B, and C remain basically the same, but D is starting to decrease from 0 0.82 to 0 0.61. Another 1,000 generations have passed and the gene flow between B and D has also stopped, but it's still interacting with um, niche A at this point in time. So you've got A, B, and C, the allele frequencies are basically the same, 
They're all sticking between that 0 0.8 to 0 0.85 range. But D has in decreased from 0 0.82 originally to 0 0.48. So if we're talking about our types of speciation, there are three types of speciation that we could be um, looking at. Allopatric, parapatric, and sympatric speciation. So at time point one, there's equal gene flow, equal allelic frequency in all of the um, niches, indicating a high degree of inbreeding between all of the groups A, B, C, and D. The trends show that the niche labeled that as D has a progressive decrease in allele frequency from the gene, um, you can even quote the data points from 0 0.82 to about 0 0.48. This is supported by the gene flow halting between C and D at time point 2 and further from B and D at time point 3. The gene flow between niches A, B and C remains quite constant throughout all the time points as shown by the arrows and the constant allelic frequencies of 0 0.8 to 0 0.5, 0 0.85. This evidence supports a potential speciation event at niche D. However, niche D is not totally isolated as there is still gene flow from A to D. So if it is not completely isolated, it can't be allopatric speciation. Remember, allopatric speciation is where they physically get split up and no gene flow occurs between any of the populations. Only sympatric and parapatric have um, speciation between populations. However, because there is still a um, element of population isolation through the niches, this supports parapatric speciation over sympatric speciation. So sympatric speciation basically happens where like a random chance event causes um, one particular group of individuals to exchange genes more than the others. It doesn't actually isolate the individuals from any of the other niches. Whereas parapatric speciation does have a method, like a mechanism of isolation. Um, think about it like this. Allopatric speciation is total isolation, so the gene flow stops completely. Parapatric speciation is where the isolation decreases but isn't completely stopped. And sympatric speciation is speciation that happens with continuous gene flow. I hope that all makes um, sense. Radio. That brings us to the end of the um, lecture. I hope that was helpful. I know it was a lot of questions at once. Please um, do include any questions that you may have. And just before we leave, I want to show you this website that I use for like a lot of my students. Um, this is actually created by me or like any of the other tutors I know, but I know I use this in high school. It's a, QC a QCE biology revision page where somebody very, very helpful has gone together and compiled revision notes for all of the dot points in unit three and four. So they have all of the notes like organized into unit three, topic one, topic two, um, topic like unit four, topic one and topic two, and then a bunch of like revision resources as well. So there are um, checklists that you can download for all of the syllabus stop points, all of the um, definitions that you need to memorize. I don't know if it'll let me do this. Yeah, see all of the definitions are there for um, according to what you need, like exactly what you need to know. Um, you've got revision sheets for unit three and unit four and revision booklets as well. There are also a few paid resources, but um, I think you can just get by the regular revision resources in general. So yeah, check out this website as well as remember to check out all of the other resources available on our website as well. Um, those are the two things that I mainly used in high school and I ended up with an okay mark in the externals. If you've got any other questions for me, please let me know. But um, other than that, I just want to leave you guys with... Oh, I just want to leave you guys with best of luck for the upcoming externals and not just for biology, but all of the external exams that you'll be going through. And best of luck with revision over this holiday period. Other than that...